Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Jerry Knowles representing the 124th Legislative District in Berks, Carbon, and Schuylkill Counties. As your representative in Harrisburg, I serve on several legislative committees. This session I was fortunate enough to be assigned to the State Government Committee, which reviews legislation on topics such as government reform and the election process. Joining me today is the chairman of that committee, Representative Darrell Metcalf. Representative Metcalf is from Butler County. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Good to be with you. It's always good to be with you. It's always good to be with you. So things are going well? Things are going well. Busy as ever, but uh, that's the way we're supposed to be. That's exactly right. Uh, Darrell, I thought that maybe uh, to start off, that yeah, we all come from different uh, areas uh, of, the, uh, of the Commonwealth, and, you know, we've got... Uh, people from the uh, from urban areas, people from the suburbs, people from the rural areas. And I was wondering maybe if you could just talk about your district in terms of where it's located and what, you know, what type, what type of an area do you represent? Sure, my, my district's the 12th district in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and I live in Butler County, actually Southern Butler County. It's about 20 miles north of Pittsburgh where my home is. Um, so if you uh, had about 220 miles west of Harrisburg, um, make it out, make your way out through the mountains and over the hills and through the woods and you'll, you'll end up in Butler County about 30 miles before you hit Ohio. So we're in, I'm in uh, western Pennsylvania. Um, I live in a uh, area that's a high growth area, about 28,000 people in my township, um, but I represent a 10 municipality area and uh, a lot of it is still a rural setting with uh, quite a few farms and, uh, and uh, lots, lots of uh, wild game for, uh, for the hunters that are out there. What's hot out there, Daryl? What's the issue in your legislative district that seems to be most important to your constituents right now? I think, I think right now one of the uh, areas of interest is the development of Marcella Shale um, because we're seeing a lot of development in Butler County where I'm from and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, job opportunities created by the development of the Marcella Shale and uh, we're seeing uh, lower gas prices of course as a result of it, natural gas and uh, we're seeing uh, opportunities for more energy independence for our nation as a result of it. So we've had a lot of folks moving into the area that are working uh, with the Marcella Shale companies. We've had a lot of folks in the area that are finding employment, a lot of business owners that are realizing um, increased business. A little restaurant that I, uh, that I frequent in the uh, more northern part of Butler County has seen a, a growth in their business because of a lot of the uh, folks coming through and working in the Marcella Shale industry. So that's been one of the, uh, one of the big areas of interest for, for us most recently. We're kind of going off script here a little bit, Daryl, but I wonder, uh, we, we hear about, uh, you, you know, we, we hear about the drilling, we hear about the jobs, uh, is there, and then we hear a lot lately about a severance tax in addition to the impact fee. Uh, for a guy that lives in shale country, does, is that a concern to you? Oh, it's a, 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 a large concern for many of uh, the business owners in our area along with residents. Uh, one of my townships has over 70% of the property in that township under lease for uh, development for extraction of natural gas. So there's a lot of property owners that are realizing benefits um, from the Marcellus Shale development. And when they hear about the tax, um, they understand that there's no magic uh, um, potion here or magic uh, to taxing a product or a service. Ultimately, the consumer is going to pay in the end. And, and, and they are some of the property owners that are that have joined together, leased, pro leased out property. So ultimately, they're going to be paying uh, as consumers, and also um, they're going to see less demand for uh, their product because many of the drilling companies are going to go elsewhere. We've already seen it with the impact fee that was passed. Uh, we saw Talisman Energy, a Canadian company, that put their headquarters, or their uh, uh, USA headquarters, in my district, to open that up in my area and uh, the Speaker of the House, Mike Terzai's area, um, kind of right on the border there. And they opened a new facility, and that facility um, has had very little activity as a result of the impact fee. They move, remove most of their drilling rigs from the state. If we see a severance tax, we're going to see more of that with drilling companies going elsewhere to, to drill where they're not being taxed as high. And see, that's what people need to understand. People have this idea uh, that the gas is here, so therefore, don't worry about it. You can, uh, you know. And the other thing, Daryl, is that uh, I don't know that people realize that they pay each and every tax that every other business does. Right. And along with that, 
now there's an impact fee, which the impact fee has been good. It's been very helpful to some of the local communities, but I think people lose sight of the fact that, they, that they're creating good jobs. Uh, and and uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to get that out there because I think that's important. I don't have any I don't have any shale uh, in in terms of drilling in in my area, but uh, it's something that people often talk about. Well, and it's helping the state treasury. We're seeing a lot of revenue coming into the state treasury, so ultimately it helps all Pennsylvanians when you see the economic activity that the state is realizing a benefit from, and the state taxpayers are realizing a benefit from that uh, energy development that we're seeing through the Marcellus Shale. And as, we, as we're watching that occur, and, and then you, you watch others on the other side that are trying to stop it or trying to tax it, which is ultimately going to stop it, um, you, you realize that if, if, we, uh, if we want to see Pennsylvania move forward, if we want to see jobs created, we have to develop the natural resources that we've been blessed with. Darrell, uh, you are the uh, majority chair of the State Government Committee, the House State Government Committee. Can you talk briefly about what your responsibilities are as our chairman and, and what, just exactly what issues that we deal with in, in State Government Committee? Well, that's a good question because as, as chairman of, of a committee, uh, which is um, given out based on seniority in the legislature, I've been in legislature 16 years now, this is my 17th year. I've been a chairman for about the last four and a half to five years. Um, as a chairman, I'm kind of the gatekeeper for legislation that is sent to my committee. Uh, the Speaker of the House refers all legislation to various committees, and once that legislation goes to a committee, then that chairman of that committee needs to decide um, whether or not a bill is going to move, or if it's worthy of movement, if a hearing should be held on it, if an informational meeting should be held on it. So we receive hundreds of bills uh, during a legislative session in the state government committee, and we have to pick and choose on which bills are good ideas that uh, will benefit the citizens of the Commonwealth. And, and we do that in conjunction with working with yourself as the uh, member secretary of the committee and other members of the, of the committee, um, especially from the Republican side of the aisle because we've been elected to govern, we're the majority, and uh, we have uh, 16 members on the committee as Republicans and the uh, Democrats have 11 members on the committee. So we have a 27 member standing committee and, and ultimately we're the uh, gatekeepers for legislation that's assigned to us. Mr. Chairman, you talked about uh, your, this is your 17th year in the House of Representatives, and uh, this is uh, budget number 17? It is. Hard and to believe. Wh where, wh we have grave concerns about what we're seeing right now, and I, j I just wonder if you could, if you could talk about past budgets and, uh, and compare, compare this budget right. with past budgets. Well, normally, after you've received the governor's budget address, you come away with um, a basic idea of the direction that the governor would like to see the state take from an executive standpoint. And, and then the process begins for the legislative activity that occurs through appropriation hearings and, and uh, hearing from the various departments and agencies. And, and then we as members ultimately will be uh, um, draft, crafting a budget with appropriations and with our, with our leadership here and then moving that forward uh, and hopefully to the governor's desk for a signature before the uh, June 30th deadline. Uh, but this, this most recent address by this governor was just so unrealistic um, that it, I think it causes a lot of people to wonder, what is the budget going to look like this year? Uh, the governor's administration, the new governor, is arguing that uh, it has to be taken as a whole. Well, that's not, that's not reality. The governor puts his priorities in the budget. The legislature, um, various legislators representing the the areas that they come from have the interests that they're representing in the budget process and, and we're all going to negotiate out and try and craft a budget. Um, for many of us, especially in the Republican caucus, uh, the priority is to make sure that the taxpayers of Pennsylvania are protected. Um, government uh, needs to live within its means. This governor is proposing a $4.7 billion tax and spend increase this year. Just unseen. Um, I've never seen such a uh, proposal uh, since I started here in the legislature. So he's proposing to increase personal income tax that uh, your, the working taxpayers in your district are paying by 21 percent. He's proposing to raise the sales tax that all of us are paying in Pennsylvania by 10 percent, expanding it to items such as diapers and uh, even the caskets. So when you, when you see that kind of a proposal, um, you wonder where, where is he going to go with this budget? Um, and right now I think it's uh, incumbent upon the leadership um, in the legislature and the, the members of the legislature to assume the leadership role in advancing a budget because the, the, the new governor has obviously kind of cast aside that role of leadership proposing something that's so unrealistic from the start. You know, Daryl, when you, when you talk about, uh, I, I don't know that people can grasp it, but when you talk about uh, $30 billion, right. okay, when you talk about that, uh, but somebody, I, I was having a discussion with a guy and he said to me, 
if the if the budget that was proposed by the governor were, were to be enacted, that we would be spending one thousand seventeen dollars a second throughout the year. One thousand seventeen dollars a second. Well, it's hard to imagine because, like you said, most families operate um, in thousands of dollars in their budget, or even you know, at scraping at the end of the month, maybe in tens or hundreds, uh, trying to make ends meet. And that's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, so when you come here to Harrisburg and people start talking in millions and then billions, um, and it gets very easy for people to lose sight of um, what the average taxpayer is fighting with every day out in that economy, trying to make ends meet for their family. Um, and that's where I think our responsibility as legislators is to help bring the governor back to reality and understand you can't increase taxes by $4.7 billion on, on the working men and women of the state. Um, you're going to cause more of them to vote with their feet and leave the state. And that's the last thing we need. We need more people to come back to Pennsylvania. We've lost a lot of our youth, the fleeing to other states to get jobs. We need to see jobs created here. And the way to do that is not to enact this governor's budget, to, but to enact a budget that's going to protect the taxpayers and, and advance the interests of taxpayers in the state. And, you know, I, uh, I, I, sometimes uh, people say, you need to work with the governor. You need to... And, and I think uh, that, that we all agree that there's times that there needs to be, you, you need to build consensus. But when you start at the dollar figure that he did, I mean, uh, I, you know, are you telling me that you want to see uh, two point, you know, two point three billion dollars increased in spending? I, I, uh, I always felt pretty good about the fact that we as Republicans uh, would establish how much we have to spend and then we see where we can best spend those dollars. Right. That's the approach that I think we've taken, and I think, I think it's a responsible approach. And uh, I tell people, I want to work with this guy, okay? Uh, but I, 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 at one point somebody was talking about the governor, and I said, look, uh, the governor's a nice guy. I, I said, and uh, you know, they said, well, how do you think he's going to be in terms of his effectiveness? And I said, well, it depends on whether or not we get, uh, whether we get Tom Wolf the small businessman, or Tom Wolf, the union leader. If we get the union guy, you better hold on to your wallets because well, that's exactly uh, right. And I, th I think even through his most one of his most recent uh, actions with his pen, his executive order to try and unionize um, some of these healthcare workers that have not been unionized in the past, um, and trying to do that through executive order is is uh, the wrong approach. And I don't believe it's even allowed under law for him to do such a thing. Um, just as his moratorium on a death penalty. Um, the supermajority of Pennsylvanians believe that if somebody commits a heinous crime, we should utilize a death penalty to be a deterrent to those in the future and to ensure that that criminal who's been a murderer has been um, prosecuted and ultimately punished for their crime. Uh, when the governor comes in and puts a moratorium on that even the District Attorneys Association comes out and, t and says was um, against the current law that we have, um, we've got a problem because this governor doesn't recognize um, the law as has been established by this legislature. And we need to bring him back to reality and part of it's going to be this budget process that he can't spend another $4.7 billion without damaging the economy and hurting the taxpayers of the state. And, and I, I just hope that people will understand that guys like you and I are doing what we think is responsible, doing what we think is right. And we just can't simply sit back and nod our heads and, uh, and, and allow, uh, allow him to, to spend uh, the money that he wants to spend in, in this budget. Now, well, I, think, I, I think from taxpayers that I've heard from in Pennsylvania, we're, we're their hope for actually making sure that things go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Wolf may have won the gubernatorial election, um, but we also won our elections, and we won strong, strong majorities uh, for the Republicans in the House and the Senate. We came back with stronger majorities we've had in the past. Our majority just went up to 120 with a new win in Philadelphia just within the last week or so here. So we're 120 strong in the House, uh, 30 Republicans strong in the Senate. Uh, and, and we need to govern, and we need to make sure that this governor knows that uh, reality is not, is not coming in and proposing to spend $4.7 billion that you don't have and that the people of Pennsylvania don't have. Because and when they say they want you to work with the governor, possibly, um, ultimately it's we the people that are the government. Mm -hmm. And we've been elected by the people to be their voice in this process. Mr. Chairman, uh, at this point we're going to take a short break, uh, but legislative report will return in a moment.
Did you know that Fort Indian Town Gap, located in Lebanon County, is home to Pennsylvania's only Veterans Memorial? C.J. Frederick of Westchester, Bucks County, submitted the winning design that now honors those men and women who have sacrificed their lives in defending this great country. Dedicated to the Commonwealth on October 7, 2001, the Veterans Memorial is surrounded by freestanding walls and houses an amphitheater, which can accommodate large crowds during an event. Strategically placed in the front of the amphitheater is a tomb that reminds visitors of those who gave their lives protecting the freedoms of this nation. The design suggests a war-damaged structure in which Frederick wanted to impress upon those visiting the horrific arena of war. Now you know. Did you know that Violet Oakley was the first female artist to receive a large commission for artwork done in a United States Capitol building? In 1902, Joseph Houston, designer and architect for the third Harrisburg Capitol building, commissioned Violet Oakley to paint murals for the governor's reception room. He believed that Oakley's contribution would add interest to the building and act as an encouragement of women of the state. Prior to beginning her work for the Capitol, Oakley set out to England to conduct research for her murals. Upon return, she decided to center her artwork on William Penn and the founding of Pennsylvania. Oakley made sure that Penn's ideals of justice and peace could be seen throughout her work. In 1906, she completed 13 murals titled The Founding of the State of Liberty Spiritual and was placed in sequential order around the governor's reception room. These murals were some of the first to be installed in the Capitol. When Edwin Austin Abbey, another artist for the Capitol, died in 1911, Oakley was offered another opportunity to create murals for the unfinished Senate and Supreme Court chambers. Her work on the Senate murals, including International Understanding, was completed by 1919. Oakley then completed the Supreme Court murals, including the Divine Law, by 1927. Oakley is said to be the principal artist for the Capitol, with a total of 43 murals on display. She remains one of the greatest muralists in the United States. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. I'm State Representative Jerry Knowles, and my guest uh, for today is Representative Darrell Metcalf. And uh, Chairman Metcalf is the uh, chairman of the House State Government Committee. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I really appreciate you taking time to be here today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, uh, one of the things that I hear constantly from constituents uh, that is a major concern and this certainly ties in with uh, with the uh, with the budget and that would be pension reform and my response is they 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 say are you going to get anything done and i say we don't have a choice we have to get something done because that is uh, that has such an impact on the budget and i just if you could share your thoughts with me on the, on the whole situation with the pension I think the, the pensions have to be addressed. Uh, we're, we're seeing the pension costs as a, as a driver for increasing costs in both the state budgets and the uh, local school district budgets. So we have to address the pension issue. And I think one of the first things we need to do is to advance legislation that's going to require that all future employees go into a defined contribution plan. Um, defined benefit versus defined contribution. Um, defined benefit plans were the pensions of old. Um, when I worked for DuPont, DuPont had switched uh, prior to my leaving DuPont for uh, many years ago, they had switched us over to a defined contribution plan from a defined benefit plan. A lot of corporations have went that, went that direction because their defined benefits are not sustainable. And for the state taxpayer, for the local school district um, property taxpayer, defined benefit plans for school employees and state employees is not sustainable. So we have to switch to a defined contribution plan that's more in line with what the private sector has for their retirement, and we, sh we should be doing that immediately. Yeah, it, it certainly, uh, because when we, when we talk about the effect that that would have, uh, it's astronomical in terms of uh, the, the increase uh, in terms of what we have to pay this year, what we have to pay next year. Right. And we've got to absolutely, positively, we have got to get that under control. And I, I actually believe, uh, I believe that we will because it's something we need to do. I don't think we have a choice. And we have to, we have to deal with the issue of the unfunded liability for the current system. Um, we, we, have sit, we have some some various uh, um, variables within the pension system and pension reform that we've been talking about. And one of the areas of savings is how much we're paying to the managers who are investing the money. Um, there's been estimates that we could save $700 million a year 
um, based on how we're investing the money and who we're using to invest the money. So there's, there are areas that we can realize some savings, um, but ultimately we have this huge unfunded liability that's been created uh, through various uh, situations that have occurred um, when you've seen um, politicians granting additional benefits in these systems. And that's why a defined benefit plan is not sustainable from a government perspective, because when the defined benefit is fully funded, then the politicians decide they're not going to invest money in it anymore to pay for benefits, so they divert that money to other expenditures. And then when there's losses in the marketplace, they come back to the taxpayers and ask for them to make up the loss. So the taxpayer always is held um, responsible for these defined benefit systems. In, in times of plenty, um, the systems are fully funded and politicians use the money elsewhere. And in times when you're, you're a little more bare um, and, you're, and you're, you have some losses in the market, then you have politicians coming in and uh, telling taxpayers, well, now you've got to take care of this unfunded liability. So we have to make a change. It has to be a change that gets to the root of the problem, which is changing from defined benefit to defined contribution. You know, the other way, uh, Daryl, that we, we need to, uh, and I, I, uh, I tell people all the time in my district office, uh, we've cut expenses tremendously, a lot of little ways. In other words, uh, if I get a letter from you as a constituent, you get a letter back. If I get a phone call, you get a phone call back. Right. If I get an email, you get an email back. It's unbelievable the amount of money that we have spent, or that we have spent, that we saved in postage. It's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I share a secretary here in Harrisburg. I know that's not something that's possible. You're a committee chair, and that requires more staff than a than just a, uh, a guy like me that's uh, in in the legislature for a shorter period of time. So I can I can deal with that. But we need to lead by example, and I think we're doing that. And the other thing that I wanted to just run by you is you're well aware of House Bill 153 which reduces the size of the legislature, not the legislature, the House of Representatives, from 203 to 153. Uh, now, there's a variety of reasons that, uh, you know, that we can, that we can talk about in, in, in terms of why it should be done, but I think you, your, your position is, has to do with economics. Well, it, well, it is, and that's uh, your, your legislation. I appreciate your leadership and in introducing that this session, and we're looking forward to working with you to advance that bill to the full, full House and hopefully get it over the Senate. And can you explain, if you would, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but could you explain so, uh, and uh, that the process that this needs to follow? But it would be a constitutional amendment, so we have to pass it through the House and the Senate and then we have to pass it in a second consecutive session to the House and Senate, and then it would go, go before the voters for the voters to decide if they'd like to decrease the size of their legislature, of the House of Representatives. And like you said, your bill proposes to go from 203 to 153, so almost a 25% reduction. And from my perspective, my primary reason for supporting this initiative is to say if we can reduce our own body by 25%, then we can call upon the executive branch and the judiciary branch to reduce their expenditures, to reduce their staffing, to reduce their size, and to ensure that we're protecting taxpayers. If we reduce the executive branch even by 10%, just a 10% reduction in welfare spending is over a billion dollars, a billion dollars of savings. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping that, uh, that we can move that bill. And, I'm looking uh, forward to working with you on it. Yeah, and I appreciate your help. You have been very helpful, as, as has your staff. Uh, we as a committee, it seems like uh, we get, uh, and I, I kind of enjoy it because my personality is somewhat like yours, we get the hot button issues. We have had some hot button issues and uh, it seems like the, uh, the, the committee's uh, members from both sides of the aisle, um, that they've put members on there from the, uh, the uh, Democrat side that are very liberal and on the Republican side they've put uh, many of our conservative members on the committee. So uh, we do clash on some issues. And, uh, and we've proven to uh, leadership here in the House that uh, if they have an issue that's a Republican issue that's supported by the, uh, the people that elect us to serve and to represent them, then we can make that bill move through the process and, uh, and be victorious in, in pushing it forward for the people of Pennsylvania. Yeah, a number of issues. I mean, one of the ones that uh, I, I know that people have different views on it, but I know where you and I are on it, and, and that is voter ID. I, I'm somewhat disappointed by the direction that has state, that that has taken nothing to do with us. We did our job. No, that's exactly right. And we and we've watched voter ID laws being enacted in other states. Indiana had a huge case that went before the Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court upheld it. I believe it was Wisconsin. I believe that just had their their voter ID bill 
um, upheld. Um, we got into a court battle here in Pennsylvania and the forces that wanted to knock down our voter ID bill did not challenge it to the U.S. Supreme Court because they couldn't win there. So they challenged it to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and through the political machinations of the, uh, the court system here in Pennsylvania and through the Supreme Court kicking that bill back down and having it go to a Democrat judge in West, that's originally from Western Pennsylvania, he tossed our bill out um, on a very partisan um, decision. Uh, and then Governor Corbett did not appeal it to the Supreme Court where I believe we could have won and had our voter ID upheld. So, so we're working within the committee to uh, generate a new piece of legislation to advance voter ID. Uh, not as strong as we had the last time that got knocked down, um, but we're st we still want to make sure that we move forward because the people of Pennsylvania are asking for it. You know, the majority of people in the state support requiring that common sense measure to prove that you are who you say you are when you go to cast that very important vote to choose who's going to govern us. Can you talk a little bit about about the, uh, and I'm with you 100. percent I mean, I uh, you know I was very very glad to be a part of that initiative. But people say, well, there's not really that much uh, in terms of uh, in terms of voter fraud and this and that. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, because we learned in our hearings right. that that's not the case. Well, that's that's exactly true. I mean, we we have a, a history in Pennsylvania of elections that have been overturned. Um, and where we've, where we've seen corrupt influences trying to influence the election process uh, throughout the history of Pennsylvania. And just as recent, I believe it was as 2008's election, that we saw seven to 8,000 um, fictitious voter registration forms being sent into Philadelphia's uh, election uh, personnel there in, in the city of Philadelphia. So when you, when you see fictitious registration forms being filed, um, ultimately you have to assume that somebody is filing a fictitious registration form is trying to get on the ballot as a fictitious person so that they can can't cast a vote that uh, would not be allowed under our law. Um, we went down, myself and some of our staff and some of our members, and met with some of the folks in Philadelphia to talk about some of the inconsistencies that we've seen down there in recent elections. And it's caused us to realize that uh, the most powerful person in the election process is the judge of elections. Um, that individual that's been elected to serve there in the precinct and count the votes. Um, and if that person is corrupt, or doesn't have somebody watching over them to make sure they're doing the right thing, then our process can be corrupted. So we've drafted some additional piece of legislation to try and provide more accountability throughout our election process between the state, the county, and the individual judges of elections to ensure that we have inspectors in the polling places because in some precincts in Philadelphia they have not been able to find minority inspectors and when they have found somebody um, some of the uh, judges of elections have refused to allow those individuals to be seated even when they had a court order. Mr. Chairman, we're just about out of time, but real quickly, I uh, want to talk a little bit about the uh, rally that you asked me to speak at uh, coming up. Uh, can you give us some details on that? Certainly, certainly. We look forward to you speaking at our 10th annual Second Amendment rally, Second Amendment second to none. We've had rallies uh, every year to rally Second Amendment supporters here at the Capitol. Afterwards, they, they work the halls, talk to legislators, and let them know that they want to see our constitutional affirmed right of to bear, to bear arms um, upheld and protected. So we have a right to bear arms under the U.S. Constitution, but we even have a stronger um, definition of the right to bear arms in the Pennsylvania Constitution, Article 1, Section 21, where it says that our right shall not be questioned. So, so we have a rally to uh, defend the Second Amendment, to defend the right to bear arms, and I've asked you to speak along with some other uh, guest speakers, and we look forward to uh, what you're going to share that day. Well, and I do appreciate that, and, and I... Uh, it's going to be May 12th. May the 12th. May 12th, here at the Capitol Steps, if anybody um, is interested in attending that uh, might watch your program. Mr. Chairman, again, I want to thank you so much for joining You're us welcome. today. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. That's all the time we have for today's program. If you have any questions about any state government matter, please contact one of my local offices. The information will be on the screen in a moment. Thanks for watching. And please join me again next time for another edition of Legislative Report.